with all due respect to Jim Carrey's performance in Man on the Moon, I felt like he got the crazy a little too much of Andy, but he never got the heart. Andy had a great heart. He was like a good boy. And in many ways, his genius was that he could be the boy next door, you know, the boy from the neighborhood, from Great Neck or wherever he was from, and then do something so crazy and different that it was that kind of yin yang that made your head spin. Um, he was very sweet. I, I told you that I had seen him at the improv doing first The Great Gatsby as foreign man and then whipping off the studs off the uh, whipping off the tape off the side of his pants and revealing studs and going into the greatest Elvis I've ever seen in my life. So he certainly was a performance artist and I knew that going into it. And then I couldn't believe how sweet he was. He considered himself a song and dance man and he liked the idea that I'd already done Broadway several times and I'd worked with the Andrews sisters and you know um, that we because uh, later on there was the uh, the costume party episode where the Danny, Tony and Judd went as the Andrews sisters. I mean I'm sorry no Andy, Tony, and Judd went as the Andrews sisters. So we, I taught them their little dance and stuff. Um, but Andy was nice. I mean, he, he, he had like seven out of 13. So he wasn't in every episode. And he didn't come in on Mondays. He came in on Tuesdays. Uh, Mike Binder would come in and read the Andy parts. Um, and what, what, what happened was he'd come in Tuesday for the afternoon run through. They'd walk him through. The script was always written in English and then he would do his latka gibberish and you, you felt like you understood him after a while. Um, and then he'd come in on Friday. So he had a very truncated schedule. And, uh, you know, I know people say, oh, he hated being on taxi or that's what Man on the Moon said or whatever. When he was there, he didn't act like he hated it. And we certainly all got along really well. And I had many very good conversations with him. I flew with him a couple times. He and I ended up on the same plane for things. Um, and he was, a, but he was a character. I mean, one of the, my favorite Andy stories that I love to tell because it's sort of a shortened version of something. One day he walked in with this disgusting boil on the back of his neck. He had this boil, I'm not kidding, it was this, this size. It was like the size of a very large ping pong ball, golf ball. It was bigger than a ping pong ball or a golf ball. He, it was on, right on the back of his neck. And I said, that is horrible. He said, watch this. He made an announcement that the audience, for one dollar, if you wanted to, you could come up and touch Andy's boil. And like a hundred people lined up to touch his boil and, you know, paid him the dollar. He was a provocateur, but you never knew because he'd be sitting there and he'd have, you know, those big eyes and he'd be talking to you. And then all of a sudden something crazy would happen, come flying out of his mouth, you know? So, uh, we worked together for a few months and then, um, on, uh, on September the 29th of, uh, it was this Friday, Ed Weinberger calls us all together. And he says, all right, the show next week, uh, well, we have a guest star. Well, it's Andy, but it isn't Andy. Just play along. And we said, what? He said, well, it's, it's going to be Andy, but it's not Andy, but okay, just play along. We said, okay, what does that mean? Okay, fine. So following Monday, you know, October the 2nd, Monday, October 2nd, um, 1978, we go in and all of a sudden there's Andy Kaufman with like orange makeup, a fake nose, ugly toupee, glasses, big mustache, blue tuxedo, ruffled shirt, talking like this, chain smoking, rah, 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 like this, ah, who's this pretty lady? Ah, come here, I'm Tony Clifton. And it was, it was like, oh my God. And we were like looking at each other like, you know, I remember Tony was like, what the, you know, so. We were all, okay. So now we sit around this table and do the table read. And this is what the acting was like. He, it was the episode where uh, uh, Danny DeVito, uh, Louis De Palma's brother is gonna come back, uh, he's a Vegas guy, and they're gonna play cards to see who's going to get stuck with their mom, who's gonna win or lose and get stuck with their mom for the holidays. So this is how he acted. Well, you know, Ma, sometimes she's glad, sometimes she's sad. I mean, that's how bad his acting was, right? So now we're like humoring him, you know, but by this time, the show's been on for like three, four weeks, or three weeks, and we love each other. We know we've got a hit on our hands. We were, we're already bonded. We're three months in. It's like a well-oiled machine, and somebody from our cast is now playing Halloween a little bit early, but okay, okay, okay. 
So now Tuesday, we come in, he's got these little yapping dog things for us, these mechanical toys, he passes them out. People's, people's nerves were starting, it was starting to wear on everybody's nerves because he's not only not in the, you know, we had dressing rooms all near each other so we could all like hang out and talk in between rehearsing. Uh, he's in a trailer right outside and he's got these two hooker girls with him. So um, now we get to the Tuesday 4.30 run through and it's like chaos. And it's horrible, horrible, horrible acting. I mean, just Tony Clifton is an embarrassment and we're now angry. And it's like, you're not taking down taxi, right? What is the shit? You know, I wanted, everybody wanted to like run up and pull his nose off, but we still thought, okay, we'll talk to the producers. So the next day we, but we all called Ed together and said, this has got to stop. And they knew because it was bad. It was really bad. So the next day, we come in Wednesday, and there's uh, another actor, Richard, Richie Frange, who, who's gonna, Richie Frange, who's gonna play the part. And uh, we said, oh, phew, okay. You know, we think, okay, well, we'll see Andy next week playing um, uh, Latka next week. So uh, Jimmy Burrow says, um, so they called Andy last night, and they told him that Tony is fired. Okay, just to give you a little background, I think what happened was they had seen Tony Clifton, and they had seen, Tony Clifton opened for Andy Kaufman. And our producers must have had bad seats or something because they didn't realize it was the same person. But when they negotiated the contract with Andy, he told them that he wanted Tony Clifton to do three episodes. And they said, well, we don't know if Tony can handle it. We'll hire him for one episode. And that's what we had been told. So uh, that's why he was now, three months into the shoot, he was going to be Tony Clifton. Um, so now we show up, this is now, you know, October 4th, this is Wednesday morning and Richie Frangi's there and Jimmy Burroughs tells us, Ed called Tony, called Andy last night and said, we have to fire your friend, Tony. This is exactly what I was told, what we were told. We have to fire your friend, Tony. He said, okay, I understand, but you have to do it in person. You have to do it. So Jimmy Burroughs says to us, look, expect the unexpected. I don't know what's going to happen. So now all of a sudden after lunch, out of nowhere, here comes Tony Clifton from the back of the house with the two hookers, one on each arm, going like, hey, let's, where's the director? Come on, I got a contract here. We're going to rehearse. What's going on? Blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> Ed Weinberger clears his throat. Tony and I, Dan, Tony Dance and I start noticing that there's people filling in the bleachers, which was unusual for that time of day on a Wednesday. And all of a sudden, Ed Weinberger clears his throat and says, uh, you know, like, Tony, I'm sorry, but you're going to be fired. Blah, blah. And he goes, what? No, I'm and he starts screaming, like, to get that, I'm a bigger star than all of you, blah, blah, blah. And so Judd, who's sitting next to me at this point, he calls, he goes, the guy wants a psychodrama. He wants a psychodrama. That's what he wants. He goes, you think you're the only one with a contract here? You think that's it? And all of a sudden, the two of them, like, start going at it. And we're like, oh, no. And pretty soon, you've got two guards dragging Tony Clifton out. And he's like, I'll make you I'm the biggest star in Hollywood. I love it. You know, and screaming and screaming and this and that. I'll show you all in this. And they drag him out of the thing. And that was it. And that was like, what was that? But it was crazy performance art. People, some people were filming. Tony's got a, a copy of it someplace. And uh, it, there were people in the stands and you know, it was like, that's what he did. That's the performance artist that he was. And then the following week, Andy came back. It was like a couple weeks later, Andy came back. And he said, I could, he said to me, I could tell you're mad at me. And I said, yeah, cause you know, you don't piss on the actors. And he said, he said, yeah, but is, don't you see the beauty in this guy? Don't you see that he's really like a beautiful character? I said, no, I don't, I love you, but I don't like, I don't like Tony. I don't like Tony at all. And I think um, Jim Brooks put it the best. Cause when we all hung out together in Thanksgiving that year, uh, he said, he said, you know, an artist can paint. He can paint all he wants, but he can't paint on other artists. He can't paint, on, you don't paint on the actors. So that's the true story <laughs> of what happened. So did Andy ever acknowledge being Tony Clifton? He talked around it. He talked around it. You, you never got him to totally admit it. He just would say, don't you see the beauty in that guy? Mm -hmm. Things like that.